Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Williams Lake Councillor Michael Moses. The beautiful lake of Williams Lake is the hub for many recreational activities and a haven for natural wildlife in the community. Williams Lake is also the hub for forestry, mining, and transportation in the central caribou region of British Columbia. The city hosts the annual Williams Lake Stampede, which takes place over the Canada Day long weekend. It is also the hometown of Rick Hansen, the Canadian paraplegic athlete and activist for people with spinal cord injuries, who became famous during his fundraising Man in Motion World Tour. With clean air, homes you can afford, a thriving economy, and recreation that's minutes, not hours, from your doorstep, discover why more people are choosing long trails over long commutes, and see why life is better in Williams Lake. So stay tuned as we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Michael Moses. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start, if you don't mind, by getting to know the man behind the persona of the councillor's title a little bit. And I've got to ask the same question I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Michael? Well, thank you for having me, Chris. Um, first of all, there is no persona. What, what you see with me at the council meetings and you see with me at the board meetings is exactly what I am every single day even with, at home with my family, the things that I that I represent to the public are exactly what I represent in my private life and what I'm passionate about. Um, then re regarding the question of of where do I get my sense of duty from? Was, was yeah. that the question? Yeah, where'd your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Okay, um, I think I can I can approach this from a few different angles. So if you don't mind, I'll I'll try to do both. Go for uh, it. The, it's the... your time to talk, Michael. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the the first would be uh, growing up in um, on the Rocky Pines Reserve, which is uh, I think it's Reserve Number Two at the Lower Nicola Indian Band, just out of outside of Merritt, British Columbia. This is this is where I grew up for the first ten years of my life. Um, this would be my 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 father's band. My my father is from Lower Nicola Indian Band. My mother is from Skeechistan Indian Band. One just outside of Merritt, one just outside of Kamloops. Um, what, which both both of them attended the Kamloops Indian Residential School, which was the the big school that made the news several years back for the the two fifteen. So at um. When growing up in Merritt, I was I was raised by my family to potentially be a chief when I was older, to to be a leader for our people. Uh, but then when I was about ten or eleven years old, my family ended up moving to Williams Lake uh, for for jobs. My my father got a job here as a band manager, what would now be called a CAO, a chief administrator administrative officer at the Hatsuth uh, Indian Band. And my mother uh, received a job teaching at Thompson Rivers University, which she's, I think she's now um, 34 years tenure. Uh, wow. So that that move brought me a good four hours away from from where I grew up and where I would have 
would have uh, eventually most likely ended up in some form of leadership or some form of working for the band at bare minimum uh, because it's not up to it wouldn't have been up to me if i were a leader correct i would have been i would have been up to a vote and <clears throat> So, but in some some capacity, I would have been I would have been serving. So that that is that would have been the beginning of of my uh, my my uh, sense of of uh, entering into into leadership of of the community I was in, and and then in Williams Lake, uh, I would have felt like that that would have that had surpassed me because being being away from my being away from my reserve and away from my band um i've, I've lost contact with a uh, with a lot of my friends and family there so it would have been it would be very difficult now for me to return and to be part of chief and council i i would likely have to move back and be there for five to ten years to just to get to know people regain trust and to um have them believe that I could be be of help in in serving the band. So, in in Williams Lake, then um, I I thought I had um, maybe swayed from this path or even escaped it because uh, I I think that this is probably a sentiment that a that a lot of leaders have maybe said right on right on your show is that this is a very difficult job. Um, help, helping your people, serving your people, serving your community, um, trying to make the best decisions. It, it, it isn't all it's made out to be to, to the general public. Um, these, these are things we lose sleep over. The, the, these are things that we spend endless hours, but we only get paid for a few of them uh, on, on trying to make sure that we're educated to be able to make the, make the decisions that will be, be the most fruitful for our communities, be the most safe, be the most productive for just for now and for the future. Um, <clears throat> the, I, I did not expect two years ago, or I guess a little bit further now, maybe two and a half years ago, that, that this would have been the route that I would be on. Um, but my 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 sense of serving for this community for Williams Lake, um, it it really started oh, about two and a half years ago when when our our former mayor and former is is very important in this instance um, started started making Facebook posts and and. Uh, public announcements on on the good sides of residential school and the other sides of residential schools and this this was very painful and hurtful for our community uh williams lake is is blessed to have between 15 and 17 um first nations governments in in our in our region and right in the city proper we uh, one quarter of our population is First Nations, uh, so that the, these statements were were very impactful, very painful, and the timing was was very brutal because this was just shortly after the two fifteen were also uncovered, and for me that was very very amplified due to both my parents having gone gone to the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And every okay. every First Nations person in this region, or maybe even across Canada, if you ask them, either they went to residential school or one of one of their family went to residential school, likely their parents or their grandparents, their uncles, their aunties, all all of their close family members that are probably over fifty years old either went to day school or residential school, and so the when when this happened in Williams Lake, I. Uh, I really started paying attention to to our local government because this wasn't the first time this happened with our local government either. Even that year, even that year, it happened with one of the one of the councillors making similar comments right in the middle of a city council meeting, which all our all our all our council meetings are recorded. They're put on YouTube. You go on YouTube, you'll you will not find that episode, which, which is very odd. And so when when our mayor was making these comments there there was a 
a big uproar from the public, not just the First Nations public either, as, as you would expect. There, there are many allies, many caring people of, of all ethnicities, all backgrounds. And uh, but the the letters that the city received from from the Williams Lake First Nation, from the Salkatin National Government, um, and from many of the other uh, other First Nations in our region, uh, they they were calling for for the an apology at bare minimum, uh, at most for the for the mayor to step down, and uh, then and then the 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 city. Uh, put right at the top of their next agenda for for the mayor to to talk about these topics. So I, I attended this meeting that I believe this was the 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 first city council meeting I'd ever attended in person. I, I I'm a good friend with the with the chief of Williams Lake First Nation, Willie Sellers. And so I went and I sat behind him in the gallery just to give him moral support um, because I knew this was going to be a tough meeting. And I expected um to hear an apology from our mayor, maybe even have him step down. I thought he was a great leader of our of our region for the previous several decades. Um, he was a previous MLA here, which is our member of legislature for some of the other provinces. I think that'd be called an MPP. Um, and he, uh, it, rather than apologizing, he doubled down. He he blamed the press. He blamed the he blamed the chiefs for bringing it public. Um, saying that the, this was his private Facebook, so he should be allowed to say whatever he wants on it. Uh, all, all the whole ten yards of of denial, and that, so that that had really shocked me. And then right after that, the the rest of council were to were to comment on it, and I expected, oh, they're going to demand that he steps down. This this is the route it's going. Okay, um, as you can see, I had very high expectations and very high hopes, and um, not a very keen understanding of the process because I, I should have realized once he doubled down that there was that there nothing was going to happen. So the the rest of council. Um, uh, first off, I would like to give them give them a lot of the credit for their tenure, the the time they spent. They did a lot of great for our city, and I have a lot of lot of trust in them, and I have a lot of respect for them. But in in this instance, it really felt like they wagged their finger at at him at Walt Cobb and said, "Naughty, naughty Walt, don't do this in public." And so at that point, I had recognized that perhaps not only do we need a new mayor, but we need some new people in the seats around the table as well. So I, I went home that night and I spoke with my family and I cried and I I asked I asked my mother, how can people still get away with this? I thought we were we were further in the timeline than this. And um I, can I, I realized can I, that can I ask a question? And I apologize to interject because I hate doing this, especially when someone is talking about something so passionately. Sure. Williams Lake is known for being, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you are wearing an orange shirt as we are recording this for those who are not listening to this. But if I'm not mistaken, Williams Lake is home to the sort of the movement of the orange shirt movement that sort of sparked a national dialogue across Canada that sort of entrenched why we, uh, I, I don't want to say celebrate, why we acknowledge uh, September 30th as National Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. You're telling me a story right now, and not a story, but facts, and I believe that they are facts, facts of what's happened in Williams Lake, and the two don't match up. The two, the, the, the idea that Williams Lake sparked the orange shirt movement and what was said by your former mayor just don't add up. That's got to be kind of, and I'm going to sort of ask a very rude question, but I apologize got to piss you off a little bit that Williams Lake is known as being a progressive community that is embraces the orange shirt movement. And then you have a mayor or former mayor saying something like this. Anyone would have gotten involved at that point, wouldn't they have? You'd like to think so. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know about anybody though. Um, as I, as I was pointing out earlier, the, the, a position like city councilor or mayor or any of the other government positions that are elected these these are very difficult positions and the, these are positions that a lot of people don't have time for they they don't um 
or they don't make the time for it and they they expect that there will be people that do make the time for it people who will step up and lead and to be able to make decisions on their behalf and then and obviously this is how democracy works we we vote for the people who think will represent us we vote for our champions our avatars the people who will will ideally vote in a way that we would have voted at the board table or at meetings and um I, I I think it takes um very specific type of people to to be willing to take on these sort of roles um I I don't think we are any any better or stronger than than our our community members we we're just the the ones that are willing to speak on behalf of our our friends our family our colleagues our, our neighbors um our businesses are are people that are most at risk uh it it it's a uh, it's quite it, it's quite the journey and, and it's quite the the difficult time to to be able to have the opportunity to make decisions for for people that you care for in your community and i i i would i think that everyone is capable of these positions, but not everyone is wanting to do these positions. And and this is why we end up with maybe a dozen people uh, running for six positions, um, or in a bigger city, it, it might be in the dozens running for, for 11 positions. Um, but it does end up being a very small portion of our community who, who are willing to stand up and attempt to to speak on behalf of their their fellows um so when when you say that anybody would get involved in this uh, i i would hope that more people will get involved in the future uh especially people who who are as you said pissed off at how how things go on occasion um the 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 best way to accomplish change is to get involved and whether that means to be a candidate yourself or that means that you find candidates that you're willing to support and that you think will listen to you the, these are these are effective means of making sure that your community will change and that it'll go in a direction that you want it to a direction that's safer a direction that's healthier makes your makes your community more beautiful makes it so it's more uh, more enticing for professionals that across the country where we have difficulty maintaining because there just aren't enough. Um, so the, can I can I ask an apathy question here for a second? Because you, you you're talking please. about something that is very important to me that I truly believe, and this is Chris Brown saying this, that I truly believe that there is an apathy when it comes to municipal governance, local governance in this country. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you would see about 10, 20 people at those local council meetings and they would watch. They would want to know what's going on in the community. It'd be hard press unless there's something controversial in the uh, in the agenda or something that someone is going to be speaking about. It's hard press to find a group of people who are going to the regular council meetings that are not there because they've been elected or they're there because they're doing a part their uh, their the administration job. Is that true when when Williams Lake? Would you say that the people are apathetic about what's going on in the local governance? As long as the water turns on and the garbage is picked up, I'm comfortable with what's going on at City Hall. That that's that's a really good question that I think I can both agree with and and play the devil's advocate on this. Um love when someone plays the devil's advocate on the show. <laughs> So go there, for there it. are definitely there are definitely fewer people uh, attending meetings. Mm, I attended city council meetings for a year straight before I ran for city council, and that was between um, the the residential school comments that I spoke of and the time that I I ran for city council. So I attended for a year straight. I didn't miss one meeting, and you're correct. The only time that there are more than a handful of people are when there there's a big topic and there there there's some div divisive vote about to happen in the community um but i i don't 
fully agree that the people are apathetic. Was that the word you used? Yeah. Or 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 that they they're not paying attention anymore. I think they have new avenues to be able to tell us their thoughts. Um, but 10, 20 years ago, not as many people would have had email, not as many people would have had Facebook. The, these now, if uh, if you ask any city councillor in uh, from your show, I'm sure most of them get a lot of emails, both in support and in objection of certain votes or certain topics or even even topics that we don't have a say in. And and that's okay because hopefully we can lead them to the the people that do have a say. So um, so keep keep those emails coming. Um, and social media is one of the one of the largest avenues now for for people to get their voice to us. And unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I think it's unfortunate because now there's a lot of anonymity and a lot of anger that can be brought that that could be done in a healthier way, I believe. Uh, but it's also very fortunate because now they have a very quick avenue to be able to speak their mind. And the, this historically may have not have occurred where everyone had access to their mayor and council in such an easy and quick manner where they could just take a few seconds out of their day to get their voice out. And I think that this both has its pluses and its minuses. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you you get you. I'm assuming uh, over over the last two years since being elected to council in 2022, you have come to the realization you are not going to please 100 percent of the people in your community with every vote that you make. And I've asked that to every single councillors, and they always joke that that is the case because they know that there's always going to be people who just disagree with you. How do you? quantify what is good for the the community because you at the end of the day are one vote on that council and you have that distinct honor of casting that vote at that council table that is going to impact people locally impact them the most because i believe that the local government is the closest to the people and it makes the biggest impact to the day-to-day -day lives of people how do you quantify what is good for the government because you go out, you speak to your residents, you listen to the emails, you listen to, I'm assuming, both sides of the people who are against an issue or for an issue, but you, at the end of the day, have to make that vote. How do you do it? The The best way that I've personally found to to make these decisions on, on behalf of people who even disagree with you is by just ensuring that I show up to these meetings as well prepared as I can, as educated as I can on the topics and having as much insight and input from professionals on the topics. This could be our staff, that this could be outside sources. Um, in, in my instance, I'm, I'm very fortunate to also be on the board of directors of many of the organizations that uh, represent people that I'm really trying so hard to give give proper and strong representation to. This is uh, this includes the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Caribou Friendship Society, which is our friendship center, uh, the Caribou Conservation Society, uh, uh, among among several others uh, across the region and the province as well. Uh, our local government association, our our uh, Union of BC Municipalities. Uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Um, so, so I have. I'm really lucky. I'm really fortunate to have access to a lot of professionals when it comes to mental health, when it comes to housing, when it comes to addictions, when it when it comes to climate action, and and then the NCLGA, UBCM, FCM. They they have professionals on any any topic that affects the country, it feels like. So I'm, I'm really lucky to have resources that I can reach out to that I that are phone call away, a text away, an email away, to be able to ask questions, to be able to get insights from, from people who this those their career revolves around these topics. So when when I don't feel like that I have the 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 education or the required knowledge on a topic, I make sure that I reach out to people that most definitely do. And then I come with that knowledge that they they've armed me with they they've they've uh, provided me, and that that helps me make the decisions that I feel are best for our community, and I I make sure to do it in the most educated and caring manner that I can, and and that this allows me to feel like I can also provide 
strong representation for the people who disagree with me, who who don't like my views or or my ideas or the projects that I vote on. Um, I, I still try to do the absolute best I can by those people by making sure that I come properly educated and ready. So that 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 is that's the way that I personally try to ensure that I can represent people that don't agree with me even. Yeah. Has municipal governance been uh, what you expected? Because you, you kind of come to the uh, the municipal world a little bit later. You get involved after comments were said, and we don't need to go re revisit that, but you, you spend a whole year looking out at it on the other side of the table. You're watching people make motions. You're watching people sort of direct what's going on in your community. You get elected. You've been elected now for almost a year and almost coming up on two years. Has it been what you expected or has there been an eye-opening experience for you that you went, oh, I wish I would have known this when in, I got elected in 2022. So therefore it would have made my journey as a municipal leader, as a local elected leader, a little bit easier for myself. It, it's been exactly what I expected, Chris. I, I I took a year to prepare for this. I took a year to talk with councillors, to talk with mayors, to, to talk with previous councillors, previous mayors, to get mentorship from chiefs, to get mentorship from executive directors and presidents of the organizations I'm involved with, to get mentorship from previous MLAs and MPs. I I made sure that I came in with my eyes wide open that I would be effective immediately upon election. I, I wanted to ensure that the people that I was representing would get the best version of of myself to as a as a city councilor and a, a, as a, a person of governance. And I all all of these mentors would spend so much time with me, teaching me processes, teaching me policy, teaching me. Uh, Robert's rules teaching me how to how to make sure that I could be effective in every aspect of this job and those I, I'm so thankful to them because I believe that we achieved what we were hoping for which was first to get me elected and second to be able to have a a strong representative for for the people that I'm trying to represent in in a way that I can be collaborative with all of my colleagues, collaborative with all of the, the local organizations, collaborative with all of the, the other forms of government and to, to be able to do it in an effective manner. So that it is exactly what I thought it was because I, I made sure that I knew what it was before I would run. And I kind of wish that a lot more people that go into governance would make sure that they would do this sort of education, self-education before they would go in um, because it, it, it is a little weary to see people get into roles where they don't actually know what their role does, um, but they learn quickly. That's the best sign because these are people who care about their communities, care about the people that they see every single day, and they got involved because they wanted to help. So these these are great prerequisites as well, and they can learn the rest as they go, but it would be very nice if they would they would do some of that education beforehand so they could also be effective immediately upon entering because I, I i think this is another thing that a lot of your prior guests would say is that we've we've seen a lot of a lot of governance people get elected and the first three quarters of their term is learning what they can do and then the next the next quarter of the term is to try to do enough so that they, they get to try again and and this the, this is a, a cycle that probably shouldn't be repeated so frequently, but is. But but as I said, I have so much respect for these people who stand up and want to represent their communities, and they inevitably end up doing a good job almost every single time. So I, I have a lot of lot of uh, lot lot of love for my colleagues. <laughs> Good to hear. Um, I want to turn to my second segment now. And before I do this, I want to preface this question, as I always do, that this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion on what is going on in the community. For those who are about to send emails, you can send them to me and I will make sure that I file them in the appropriate location after saying just that. Counselor, 
in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Williams Lake today? Healthcare. We we need more doctors, just like every other city across Canada. Um, there there's a big shortage of family doctors, the big shortage of, of emergency room doctors, every type of doctor. We we need it all. I think everyone needs it all. We're very fortunate in Williams Lake that we've just recently received uh, a monstrous grant from from the federal government for a new hospital. Uh, we're we're getting. A couple new types of clinics. We've been really fortunate that the First Nation Health Authority has also opened their their very first clinic in Canada in our community. Um, so we we have it really good. So I don't want to sound too much like I'm full of complaints on this. I'm so thankful for all these different organizations for for stepping up and making sure our community can be healthier and safer. But they also need more doctors and that that is the number one is when it is the absolute norm now to wait in an emergency room for eight hours to if you have a cold if you if you have if you have any reason to see a family doctor now frequently you have to wait in the er and uh it's 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 a brutal situation i i i'm i'm so hopeful that this can see improvement in the coming years so because it it, it is it, it's a little scary. You and I both know that healthcare is not a municipal jurisdiction, though, and I and I say that right. with uh, and I say that because this is a conversation I've had numerous times on this show around healthcare. What does the city do in absence of the province stepping in and trying to help uh, local hospitals, local clinics fill those doctor shortages? Because while it is a provincial issue and it has federal ramifications as well, because the federal government gives the money for uh, health care, which then the province spends on certain areas, the municipality can recruit doctors, can incentivize doctors. What is the city doing in the short term until the province and the federal government come to the table and sort of help alleviate some of these issues or this backlog of doctor shortages in the short term? What's the city doing? Uh you named a few of them providing incentives um in in Williams Lake i believe we we have eight eight pieces of housing for for locums or for doctors to potentially move here um Williams Lake First Nation is also building housing to to uh to house doctors um and they 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 have such an amazing housing program the the it's so the the real estate they they create is is so beautiful that i think that that will make a make a large difference that that isn't our municipality though i think you're asking what does a municipality do uh, our our uh i believe our route for helping out with this uh, is is twofold one one is recruitment and the other is to make it so that our community is desirable enough that that recruitment can be successful. Um, we need we need uh, services that that professionals desire. That this this in Williams Lake, we're we're lucky. We have a lot of a lot of mountain bike trails. We have a lot of hiking trails. We have a lot of fishing, a hunting, a lot of outdoor activities. So we we do have things to attract um, some professionals, but those those are obviously uh, not things that everyone enjoys. So our our goal as a municipality is just to make our community safe enough and desirable enough and beautiful enough that that professionals will want to come here and if they do give it a chance that they will ideally stay here i i'm assuming there's a lot of advocacy work that goes on with the, this file as well like uh, i'm assuming there's not a moment whenever there's a minister in town that you are or in the city that you are that your council and your mayor and yourself are not advocating uh with the provincial government for more help in this file correct a hundred percent. Yeah, we <laughs> and, we've just recently, over the last year, really opened up the communications with Interior Health, which is our regional 
health association that represents the province and <clears throat> that that that's been a been a boon to our community that those communications have allowed us to um really ease ease the worry of our constituents um unfortunately it doesn't doesn't ease the lack of doctors but it, it does allow us to communicate with the public when things will be closed when when certain uh offices will not be available um and prior to those communications we would just have uh unfortunate rude surprises of when those would happen so um interior health is is at least being very straight and open with us and that that's that's been really appreciated because it it, it really allows us to uh let the public know the the progress on these situations municipalities are stuck between a rock and a hard place right now because you are the only level of government that cannot run a deficit you have to balance your budget every year um and when you have programs that community members rely on so often you have to look at the budget which i'm assuming you either have gone through or going through right now as of speaking um you have to look at budgets and you have to sort of make sure that everyone feels like they're getting something out of a budget, but at the same time, look at the growth and the advancements in your community around mental health, men around healthcare. How do you balance the needs of the community against the needs of the individual? Because everyone, and I don't want to say everyone, because not everyone is struggling right now, but the large portion of Canada is struggling right now with economic hardships, with the inflationary issues, with just living paycheck to paycheck because their mortgage rates are going up. You impact their day-to-day -day lives with budgets, with service levels. How do you balance the needs of the community with understanding that the decisions you're going to make are going to potentially impact them at the grocery store or whether they have to send their child to hockey this year or not because they can afford it. The, the best way that I, that I found to do this is again, to rely on the professionals that their, their careers revolve around this, their, their knowledge revolves around this, that, that that's our chief financial officer um, our CAO, uh, I, I really lean on their knowledge and their input and their recommendations to, to try to ensure that we're making good decisions for the public. Um, but do you not advocate because... for local micro issues? And I say micro issues because that pothole in front of John's house, and I'm assuming you've seen this email, that pothole is the worst pothole that that person believes is there, the, the biggest issue to them because they have to drive over it every day. Or that John park, always has a pothole. But John always has a pothole. <laughs> or Sandra, who wants a new upgrade to the playground because her children go to it every summer, and they think that their playground in their uh, area of the community needs a little bit more tender love, or, love and care while the administration can present a budget, you have to ultimately make the decision of, do I go with administration or do I try to advocate for the people as well? How do you balance the macro issues with the micro issues that people care about? A, a lot of this is definitely advocacy from, from my, myself or one of my colleagues to the rest of council, to, to the CAO and CFO and, and, then it's a balancing act. It, as you say, we 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 can't run a deficit. Um, if we want more services, that means taxes are going up. Um, that that is uh, that that is one of the one of the biggest challenges in in this balance or in the budget. To is letting the public know that what they want affects the the taxes for everyone in the community um we whether whether it's repairing an extra street because john somehow always has that pothole whether it's sally's kids get a year older every year and they like different things every year so they need improvements on all of them each each year the the these services they they all cost money and and, and that that is the the difficulty is is deciding which of these 
are are valuable enough to our community to cost everyone. Um, so John's pothole, unfortunately, costs the whole city. Um, Sally's kids playground costs the whole city. So we 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 definitely as as counselors we all have the projects that we we would hope will get funding that year um but not we, everyone's we, gonna not everyone's gonna win at the end of the day it's just you have to go out no. and tell people that unfortunately your taxes we want to keep them low and if you want everything that you want you're gonna see a 9 12 15 some communities in bc 39 okay. percent tax increase I'm, this year i'm i'm gonna go a little bit of a di different route on this answer because uh really my answer is i i rely on the cfo and cao to to help us but what i would like to do with this answer is to let the people know who do want these changes to let john and sally know that if they want these changes to write letters to us uh to get organizations involved to to uh, have some of the, the volunteer groups in the city um, advocate with them for these, uh, to, to have their neighbors uh, sign their letter with them, um, that, that their voices really do matter, but they, they need to figure out effective ways to have those voices portrayed to us. And often that isn't a comment on Facebook that says how angry they are. It, uh, a constructive letter to us that that sh tells us the problem, uh, tells us that it's a problem for more people than just to them, and gives us a, a clear-cut call to action on how we can fix it. And then if they can include other people also having this problem and that they share the opinion on how to fix it, and the, the more people, the better. That's why organizations would be really strong for this. If they can, uh, for instance, if this was, it, if this was uh, for a playground, maybe get your your Rotary group involved because they often love to be involved in these projects. Now, if Sally goes to the Rotary group and says, "Hey, we would love this upgrade to our playground. Would you be Would you be willing to do this?" That often they will they will now interact with the city, and inevitably, inevitably, then the project gets done. So the the I think for John and Sally, I, I would love if they would figure out these routes to get these projects done in a really collaborative and conducive manner that it can help as many people as possible and that that gets their projects done i appreciate and that that, that makes ahead. it that makes it very easy for michael to advocate for this at the city council table for them and we always want to make sure it's easier for the councillors to advocate for the local issues. Um, I want to flip the script a little bit here for a second. And I, I asked you at the beginning of this segment about the issues. And I got accused on this show as only talking about the negative things that happen in communities in this part of the show. And I'm going to flip the script a little bit. And I'm going to ask, what does Williams Lake get right when you go speak to other municipal leaders from across British Columbia, when you go to UBCM, when you go to FCM, what's the thing you boast about when it comes to F uh, Williams Lake? The I I touched on one of them earlier, and that's our advocacy to to get healthcare upgrades in our region. Um, I think that's something of of. Uh, of, of the dreams of very many of our, our local governments and our regional governments is having having three, four new projects in, in Williams Lake that that uh that are all very costly and not not costing the municipality a, a penny. Though those that is that advocacy work to get those to happen it is is what I think we would boast about the most to, to have those relationships with interior health, with the province, with the feds, with, with, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, there, there's price tags on the, on the buildings, but there's not price tags on those relationships to, to be able to get those type of projects done. And, and another is in the last few years, 
we've we've been able to turn our indigenous relations around in 180 and start running in the other direction. Um, I'm so proud of our council and our mayor for for uh, building these relationships so that we can have collaborative programs together. Because as you can imagine, a lot of these these upgrades to our healthcare system they come from collaboration with First Nations. And they come with collaboration with the the local health organizations, and to to be able to achieve rebuilding these these relationships after years of distrust and after um, some very un unfortunate incidents has has been so conducive to to our work and to our communities to be able to to move forward pro projects that have been on pause for years or decades um that those are those are the things that I, I really feel like Williams Lake is getting right is those those relationships with all forms of government and all of our local organizations and all of our all of our neighboring First Nations governments I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time here and I know you are a busy uh, counselor and I want to talk about my favorite subject is tourism I think what about my favorite subject. What's your favorite what subject? My, what's my favorite subject, Chris? What's your What's yeah. your favorite subject, there, counselor? My My favorite subject is, let's see, I I could go so many different directions on this. Let's go with the Orange Shirt Society. I'm wearing okay. this shirt. You, you, let's you let's do it. it out. Let, if and, you and want then, to talk then about I'll, the Orange, then I'll answer your questions. Let's, okay. let's go my let, route let, for a minute. Let's go your route for a few. If you got an extra oh. ten minutes, let's go with the the Orange Shirt Shirt route. Well, why is it I your favorite? Uh, like, I'm gonna go I'm going to go multiple routes. You you just gave me the open microphone and <laughs> I'm gonna go. So you have a the, national the audience right now who is listening to this, and for some strange reason, a large large following in. Ottawa. So for those who are listening in Ottawa, here's the time when I'm turning the tables and letting the guests talk about their favorite issues. So go ahead. Thank you, Chris. So the Orange Shirt Society, as you pointed out earlier, was was founded in the city of Williams Lake. We have we have Phyllis Webstad who who lives in our community. Um, but I need to correct you on one thing. You said uh -oh. that 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 the Orange Shirt Society has caused a national dialogue. I would like to correct you and say they've caused an international dialogue. The Orange Shirt Society is, has been recognized all over the world. Phyllis Webstad gets to speak all over the world and do us proud. Do do our community proud? Do First Nations people proud? Do Canada proud? She she's such an amazing ambassador. The Orange Shirt Society has caused so much good for for bringing attention to these causes that really need them bringing eyes bringing ears creating allies it, it's been so phenomenal to be able to see this from the ground up from from a local perspective to be able to to see Phyllis start this right from the beginning with the help of some of the some of the cookies the chiefs uh, locally like Fred Robbins um, they they've created an entity that I think will will stand the test of time and continually bring bring great attention to to these to these issues that need this attention not not just now but i think for at least decades into the future because there's a lot of healing to be done there are a lot of relationships to be built and i think that this this society is going to move forward to all of those and and uh i'm i'm so proud of them so there, there there's my my segment on what my favorite thing is so let's talk about your favorite thing no no i want to play in this sandbox for a little bit if you don't mind there okay. help, because i think this okay. is a conversation that i have not had often on this show but i think i need to because i think it's an important conversation you, you earlier in this episode at the beginning of this episode you talked about the reason why you got involved in local municipal governance and that was a mayor's comments that sort of and I'm using my own words here, not the counselor's words, but it, it pissed me off when you said that, because I can't believe in 20, 2021, something like that would have been said. But I look across Canada and I'm a Canadian wide show. I have listeners from across Canada and we are and I look at municipal issues across Canada. There is a small municipality in rural Prince Edward Island called Murray River. This council recently has uh, sanctioned one of its councillors for posting a sign a week after National Truth and Reconciliation Day last year in 2023 that called the residential schools 
travesty, a hoax. And we needed to respect Sir John A. Macdonald's uh, legacy when it came to Canada. There's a long way to go that we still have. Canada is still broken. And I say that with the respect that it is because we have unearthed something that Canada has not truly accepted. And that is staggering that I have to say that in 2024. How do we continue this dialogue without giving airtime to the people who, like your former mayor, like the councillor in Murray River, Prince Edward Island, and say enough is enough. This is something that has happened. Your family lived it. How do we give, how do we get people to have this conversation and a true conversation in 2024? To, to have this conversation in 2024, um, to have it in a better way is going to require education. Um, because the, these conversations, you're saying that we shouldn't give airtime to, to people like that counselor, to people like um, the mayor. Our, for, our former the mayor. former yeah, mayor yes I, I I didn't know if I wanted to go there because I I he 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 is he has been a leader for our region for decades and because I don't agree with some of his views doesn't doesn't okay, mean that he was I'll, a, I'll clarify that statement by saying we shouldn't give airtime to the comments that he made yes he might okay, have done um, well to the, the 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 community but the comments he made and he said and from what you've just said on the show were made on his private Facebook account. This uh, the counselor in Prince Edward Island put it on a public sign in front of his house. Like that is not a private location on Facebook where you can hide it. It is something he has put in to the general public and put it on a street that is busy in his community. So I should say Understood. we should give airtime to the comments that are made and we should be educating. I apologize. For that. Yeah. So so we it is it is education that's that's required on on all fronts. Um, to 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 begin this these collaborations the the to begin healing together to to begin moving moving forward again it, it it's going to require understanding and it, as you say that in 2024 that this still need these still need to be said it is astounding and in 2021 like i said i i, I came home to my family and asked how is this still happening um but I also I also need to point out that that these these councillors and mayors who have made these mistakes or have these views that I don't agree with, they're part of the conversation. That their views may be views that we don't agree with. They're they're hurtful. They're painful. They're inconducive to healing. They're probably just downright bad for our communities and for our country. But those those are part of the conversation, and that's unfortunate. But they those conversations need to happen, and they need to have airtime. If those people did not get airtime, those those type of those type of responses, those type of views, those type of signs, those type of Facebook posts would continue to happen if they don't get airtime. We need people to see these. We need people to learn from them. We need people to to get pissed off, and then we need people to learn. And then we need people to forgive. I I'm not no longer angry with these people. If, if they're willing to learn and they're willing to move forward, they're if they are willing to build relationships and to to have have the views that they priorly had become more respectful and to to want to heal with our communities then i forgive them and i would love to move forward with them and but these these conversations can only be had if we have have the views of the people we don't disagree we don't agree with if, if the people we disagree with the people who are hurting us are not part of these conversations they will they will they have an open path to continue those roots and if we want those roots to change, especially in our leadership, we, we need them to be seen, we need them to be heard, and then we need to move forward together. That, that, so I don't, I don't think that hiding their thoughts and hiding their views is conducive to healing. Okay, so this this has taken a turn that I didn't expect. So hopefully you're okay with this conversation, Michael. And if I if I am. if I've gone too far, just tell me. Because I, I pride myself as trying to always be always try to educate myself on things that are going on in this world. 
And I only can get educated by learning from people that I know and people who have come on this show. This is why I started this show, to sort of educate myself, but along the way, hopefully educate other people as well. You I seem appreciate to be, that, Chris. You seem to be a very forgiving person. Not a lot of people in this country are, though. How oh. you, 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 you... You, you, you've just said you want to move on. You want to educate people and educate the people who have said these things or have posted these things on social media. Don't get me wrong. Everyone has done stuff in their past that they are not happy with. And I say that because I know I have said stuff in the past that I've never been appreciative of. Um, and I ran a campaign that I was drunk one night. I got intoxicated and I said things in the past and I, I, Pride myself to try to make myself better every single day after that incident. But there are people who double down on these issues. There are people who say, you can't change my mind. How do you change people's minds? How do you educate people who just don't want to be educated, who don't want to have these tough conversations? And I, and I looked at your perspective when you were talking and I said, you know what? You're right. We do need to have these conversations with the people who have these views, but if people don't want to have these conversations anymore because they would rather tweet or X or whatever you want to call it or post it on Facebook because it's more anonymous and you can say whatever you want on these social media. So how do we have these conversations like you and I are having right now, Mike? Well, if they don't want to have the conversations, they won't have them. So I, I don't I don't see a, a clear cut answer to this unless I decide to go with it in a different direction like I have been. Um, I think that the in in these instances if they double down and they they don't want to have these conversations they don't want to change their views they don't want to heal with us then then we move on to the next person okay uh, there 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 are millions of people in canada we we can't focus so much on on every single individual when when there's so much collaboration so much relationship building and so many ways to move forward together that we can't allow a single person to hinder that so then the follow-up question to that is how do we move forward together because any municipal politician i've ever had on this show says if you have an issue come to me with a solution if you have an issue that is happening in your community uh, you always ask your residents to come with a solution so that way you can work together instead of just the municipality trying to figure this out you want people to have a solution so how what's what's your solution that we can move forward together there my uh, counselor do we have another hour <laughs> You, you, you. Um, hey, this this might so, be like a three part episode here. <laughs> okay, for 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 our local governments, um, the the beginning is relationship building. The beginning is education. So there there are plenty of courses. There are plenty of facilitators. That there are plenty of books that we can we can take part in any mixture of these. There are plenty of podcasts like yours that are out here to educate people. And if we if we take part in these as councillors, as mayors, as regional directors, and, and all the other titles in the other provinces I'm not fully familiar with, that that we can we can begin this education that we were talking about earlier. And we can start relationship building with all of the indigenous people in our in our country, in our in our regions, in our in our own community our neighbors um so with with arming ourselves with with this education we'll be able to build these relationships in a way that are that are more respectful that are more knowledgeable that take into account indigenous worldviews and knowledge systems we we can um start having collaboration and partnerships on on it could be small projects at first and then hopefully lead into major projects like hospitals and like new schools um like uh cultural centers uh, all all of these things are things that are happening in williams lake because of these these partnerships these these uh these collaborations because we we took the time to educate ourselves took it took the time to build these relationships so from a local government view it, it is definitely about education first relationship building second and then partnerships third and it almost has to happen in that order if you jump to the partnerships without the knowledge you're 
too frequently, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to put your foot in your mouth. You're going to piss some people off. And those are hard to recover from. Those will frequently take years. They, they may even take changes in personnel uh, that may be elected figures, maybe staff, what, what, whoever the case is that, that is, is deemed difficult to work with. And they may not be difficult to work with, but sometimes the first impression is very hard to recover from. That's why I say that the education needs to happen first. Um, now, to, to move this forward on a, on a national level for non-politicians, again, it, it, it begins with education. Um, but it also there there needs that there needs to be support shown for organizations such as the Orange Shirt Society to make to make sure that September 30th is marked off on your calendar as the day that you're going to go out and pay attention to learn to uh, to support. And there there are many many days in organizations like this that we can participate in that we we don't recognize how important our individual support is and how how good it makes these organizations or indigenous people feel when we have the support of of non indigenous people. Another big one is is uh, the Moosehide campaign. Um, there 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 are instances all year long where we can show our support, where we can take the time to educate ourselves. And we could even take the time to educate our own friends and family. This will this will speed things up dramatically. So it again, it, it really comes down to learning. It, it, and it comes down to to relationship building. Um, the, these these are such such easy answers. They feel like cop outs. But usually the easiest are the hardest. But I challenge everyone to actually do them. So before I go and move on to the next step, because I, like I said, I feel like we could talk about this for an hour, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that yeah. maybe in the future you and I will be able to sit down and just talk about this issue specifically, because I think this is an important conversation. But you, you talk about the relationship building. Now, you have mentioned that Williams Lake and the surrounding communities, First Nation communities, have had a very strong relationship or they're building their strong relationship together. Um, I, I don't know how to ask this correctly. So if I if it comes off insincere or weird, I apologize. Looking across Canada, Michael, do you see hope that those relationships are being built today? Yes. <clears throat> yes. As I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, my my favorite for, form of social media is LinkedIn, and I I follow our national chief on there, and I make sure to keep keep up to date on what she's doing on a week to week basis, and I see the the relationship building that she's doing with the federal government, with all the different provincial governments. And it, it provides me with a lot of hope. I, I, I do see things moving forward. I, I see in on a federal level that the, the government is implementing UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on um, the Rights of right. Indigenous People. And in British Columbia, we, we've, we've, we're also doing a lot of work with with UNDRIP and the 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 TRC oh man there's there's just so much happening on a national level right now that I can't I can't not have hope and well, I will in, have in, hope with in, you thank you and in in Manitoba we we have Wab Canoe as as the new premier I'm I still feel like I'm on cloud nine every time I get to say that out loud like they're they're there is so much going on that's positive. Um, it does get difficult sometimes to not focus on the negative, but if we can utilize the these positive happenings as as examples, as precedents of where we can go, and and how we can follow suit, and what we can do to improve our communities, then then I I do see hope, Chris. Like the this. This is a this is a hard road to be on, as a as a person of local government, but also as an indigenous person. But there there are examples all across the country that we can we can take hope from that we can try to follow suit. Um, I'm I'm really excited about it. Even not not just hopeful. I'm I'm excited 
at the progress that I see. There, there are hardships, there are setbacks, but that that's all they are. They're, they're setbacks and we'll continue moving forward. I, I have faith in in our governments. I have faith in in um, in our indigenous people's strength and and our 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 forward motion. That that I have no question that that we're moving forward. I had to think about it briefly before I answered, but it wasn't to think of yes or no. It was was to think of how to tell you yes. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Before. This is just a fascinating conversation, and I just got to get this on the record because the Federation of Canadian Municipalities will be meeting here in Calgary, my hometown, uh, my home city, I should say, not my home city, but uh, the city that I am currently residing in because I'm originally from Ontario, uh, later on in June, and FCM will be meeting. Now, I understand that you are part of FCM, and correct me if I'm wrong, but did you start an advisory committee for Indigenous and First Nations uh, councillors and local officials at the last year's uh, conference in Toronto? Uh, how's that going? I I did, but it, it, that that's a that's a work of many people, not just myself. I I I did get to get to be the voice of it, and I'm I'm really thankful for that, and I'm honored that I that I was able to uh, partially represent our Indigenous delegates from across the country. Um, so yeah, we're we're in the in the midst of creating an Indigenous caucus at FCM at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and for uh, I'm sure that this audience generally knows what that is, but for for those for those that don't, the FCM is an umbrella organization that that advocates for all the local governments across all of Canada. So they're 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 pretty strong. They're they're a very strong group. Um, and this this um, this this indigenous caucus that we're creating. There's only a handful of caucuses in the FCM, and generally they're they're reserved for groupings of provinces and Ontario might have its own because like, they're so big but otherwise there's there's a caucus for the territories there's a caucus for western provinces for the maritimes and there's one one caucus that isn't for um the provinces and that's for the big city mayors uh so the the hope of this indigenous caucus is to to be able to provide a voice to the indigenous delegates from local governments across the whole country as a group to to be able to provide indigenous views and indigenous guidance on on policy making at FCM that will have a similar voting prowess in in, in the organization as as the whole province of Ontario and and that I feel like that that's a pretty big deal to to ensure that Indigenous views are taken into account and inside the organization and also in in the advocacies from FCM to the the federal government. I I think that the, these are one of those projects that that give me a lot of hope. That we we were just talking about is there hope for this moving forward? This project, if people would will look into it and see the the potential of what it could accomplish over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and the the unlikelihood of it having existed in the last 10, 20, 30 years, you can see clear progression and you you can you can extrapolate a lot of lot of hope and excitement from that. Yeah, most definitely. And and when uh when the FCM is in Calgary this year, we should go and have a coffee and maybe that's when we can do our our next our next talk on this subject. Well, there's that, but also as I've promised on this show, that if you come on my show, I come to your community. So I'm going to be back in Williams Lake in May. So the only reason I know May. that is because I'm going to be going up through uh, Williams Lake up to Dawson uh, City later on in uh, May because I have to go attend the Association of Yukon Communities Conference. And I'm going to try and hit as many municipalities on the way up there before I come back. So I've got to ask the question because this is now the third segment and I've got to talk. Well, now the fourth segment because we <laughs> talked about the Orange Shirt has a committee um what is what are should i should i should say some of the tourist destinations that you recommend to people when they come to williams lake oh okay so <laughs> just i'm 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 going to you can do williams lake you can do the surrounding area whatever you wish this is your two minutes to pitch some tourist destinations that people need to see when they're in the area all right that this is great um 
so just just south of the city if you're coming from the vancouver side there's williams lake first nation and they they have um they they have a golf course they have an uh, amazing uh powwow arbor uh they they have some hiking trails so south of the city i would just i would recommend visiting there just north of the city we have hatsul first nation and they they have a they they have a cultural center that includes uh um traditionally dug pit houses i would i would highly recommend going there and um and west of the city we we have the Sokotan nation and uh they have perhaps what is maybe the most pristine land still remaining in canada uh, including including glaciers glacial water um oh it's it it, it it's I, I i can't imagine a more beautiful place in the world so uh I, I would love to give a shout out to to um, to to all the First Nations communities and what they're providing uh, in our community. So I, I would I would recommend those. Um, so I'm going to ask the last question now. And we started by talking about you, and we've talked about a lot of things over the last hour. And I've got to know though, and I want you and to encompass this entire interview if you can. What makes the city of Williams Lake such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I I think what I, I'll, I'll, I'm always I'm I'm forever the indigenous advocate. Um, that it's one of the things that you can expect from me at all the all the dozen different boards I'm on. People ask me how I. Uh, differentiate the hats that I'm wearing at different times and my 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 straightforward answer is always that I have my indigenous hat on at all times so you you can expect my my answers to very frequently um re revolve around that and to to at least come from that direction if not always ending there and in 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 this instance what what gives our community uh a lot of um a lot of uniqueness there is is the 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 15 first nations governments that that we're so fortunate to have in our region um it's it, it's such a a variety of culture a, a variety of events and and a variety of beautiful caring people that we that we have here to to have just under five percent indigenous people in canada but to have over 25 percent indigenous people in williams lake uh it 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 makes me makes me very proud of, of our of our city and our of our region to have this much representation and to to have all these all these different different forms of of government different forms of culture different different people from every different direction from our city and within the city and to have this diversity shown on our city council with the south asian mayor with an uh, first nations counselor and to have four out of our seven be be female uh, really it's it's the diversity in our community which is is something that often our major cities have like Vancouver Toronto having the having that sort of diversity we i feel like that we don't have the same diversity but we have a different type of diversity and it's something that i'm really proud of here counselor i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart um i never know what i'm going to get out of these interviews when i sit down with local elected leaders but you are a wealth of knowledge, and I feel like I've just scratched the surface of who is Councillor Moses, but I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, for taking a little bit more time than uh, you uh, originally asked, and having this conversation, because I only can be educated by people like yourself and learning from people like you who make up our great communities and make up our great municipalities. So thank you so much for, A, educating me a little bit today, and I hope this conversation doesn't end after I press the stop record button today yeah thank you so much chris the the service you're providing and ensuring that our delegates from across the country get to share their knowledge with each other through this and to be able to learn from such a 
educational and and a fun format. You you provide you provide some really deep questions, but also some entertainment value with it. I, I really appreciate it, and I'm sure I can share that sentiment along with a lot of my colleagues. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last year. If you can Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.